All right, I'm going to begin. What fun is this? All these, all these friends I get to see in one room. Uh, thank you for coming. I've seen people here all the way from my, my, my first year torts. Um, torts, right? <laughs> That's more of a modern phenomenon. The, the, first, the three of us don't know about the, the, the chorus uh, of torts. All right, so I'm going to talk today uh, about the Supreme Court environmental law, something I think a lot about. I do scholarship just involving the court, scholarship just involving environmental law, and then I, I, marry, I marry the two. Uh, and in the last few years, I've written, this is sort of be the fourth article uh, I've written on the court, so I thought I'd bring them together. And I, I give talks everywhere else. I don't give a talk here at Harvard Law School. Well, that's sort of silly. I should give a talk here at Harvard Law School. Before I begin, though, I want to give a shout out. I have three research assistants uh, give you a lot of help. Uh, on this article, all uh, uh, graduating thrills. I just want to thank them uh, at the outset for the work they uh, did on this. All right, why now? Uh, why am I giving this talk? Why have I written a lot uh, on this topic in the last few years? Uh, it's for obvious reasons, right? There's a lot happening at the court. Uh, in 2022, we had the West Virginia, that's the clean power plan case, uh, where the court basically a upheld the repeal by the Trump administration of the Clean Power Plan, uh, invoked the major question doctrine uh, for the first time. Uh, last year, we had the Sackett uh, case, uh, another big environmental case involving the Clean Water Act, uh, where the court dramatically reduced the geographic jurisdiction of the Water Act, anywhere from about 40% to maybe up to 70%. Uh, and finally, uh, the two Chevron case involving the magnuson Stevenson Act, where the Chevron I'll be overruled or not. One which the Solicitor General said if they do, right, it would be a convulsive shock uh, to the legal uh, system. I want to warn you, it's not a happy talk. So I decided at least to remind you of the parody uh, for a moment, uh, which was a happy time. I actually love the parody. It's one of my favorite uh, things every year uh, at Harvard Law School. But this is not a happy talk. All right, one, uh, it's a happy talk because this has been my long-standing focus for teaching and scholarship uh, and environmental law. I, mean, uh, I sort of lived and breathe it. It's what I teach. It's what I write about. It's what I think about. To give you a sense of how, sort of, how deep it is in me, if you, if you see this thing here, and I'm going to show you a close-up. This was given to me by my friend's second year of law school here at Harvard Law School because they couldn't believe when they looked at my resume how many times the word environmental appeared. Uh, so they said, we'll just give you a stamp so you don't have to type it anymore. You can just, uh, do, I've, I've saved that. It's on the bookshelf uh, in my room. All right, uh, I'm enormous pride. I've written a lot about the making of environmental law, <clears throat> first edition, second edition. I've been able to witness it, which has been really fun. I really got in this business when I was 16 years old, uh, which is now a while ago. And watching everything environmental law has accomplished uh, over the last uh, sort of 50 years, uh, is just ex extraordinary. Uh, so enormous amount of legal revolution in this country, which has managed to bring down enormous amount of air, water, and land pollution, while at the same time not leading to the kind of devastating economic effects that people thought uh, we might have. In fact, look at other parts of the world who've had those kinds of economic growth without these kinds of laws, they're the ones who have devastating uh, effects, and that's the environmental catastrophe, the results. Uh, finally, I'm also a frequent defender of the court, often being accused of naively so. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Supreme Court. I'm an institutionalist that way, and that's been hard to hold on to uh, in the last uh, several years because I think uh, right now um, uh, paralyzing partisanship has shut down Congress uh, since 1990 for most things environmental with a, you know, the blip, losing the authorization side, pivot in the last several years, and now I think it's leading to Supreme Court dissent uh, as well. I don't like to see it happen, uh, and I've long resisted uh, the idea. So the talk's going to be in three parts. Uh, part one is why the court's ruling is so relevant to environmental law. I'll give you a background on why the court plays an outsized role here. Uh, second, how for the 50 years until OT 2020, environmental law really was largely overcame an increasingly uh, conservative court. Uh, uh, the court was pretty balanced even though it's a pretty conservative court uh, ever since the beginning of, of modern environmental law, and how the current court's hyper-conservatism, I think, uh, threatens to erode a lot of environmental law's 
promise. That's why it's an unhappy talk. All right, so first, why the courts are so relevant to environmental law. Uh, and here, you'll, you'll notice a pattern. There are going to be three parts. I often think in, in, in three, threefold ways. One is really the challenge of environmental lawmaking, why it's so hard to make it. Uh, two, the resulting friction with all, within environmental lawmaking institutions uh, and how those generate legal issues that are triggered by the lawmaking process, by these cross-cutting issues, how so many of them are decided by the United States uh, Supreme Court. And that's why the court matters so much. So first, the challenge of our lawmaking, I'm going to make it pretty simple for today. It's really this. It's rooted in the fact that environmental law must reflect uh, the problems it addresses. Uh, and by the laws of nature, uh, environmental law concerns are spread over time and space. And that means that activities at one time cause consequences at another time. Activities at one place cause consequences at another place. And we're not just talking about minutes or hours. We're talking about you know, months, years, decades. Now with climate change, hundreds of years in terms of spreading things out. Over space, not just you know, feet, miles, a thousand miles, but can be tens of thousands of miles around the globe. And the implications for lawmaking are that's hard to make laws which address something where cause and effect are spread over time and space. Because you're necessarily regulating activities at one place at one time for the benefit of people activities at another place at another time. So environmental law is inherently redistributive. And redistributive laws are hard to do. They're hard to say, you all have to do something to curtail what you're doing because other people, other activities need basically to benefit from the curtailment. And when you spread things out over time and space, you're necessarily going to have enormous uncertainty about cause and effect at the same time. Uh, the distinctive feature of environmental law, the result from this, it's redistributive. It's highly complex. The ecosystem is highly complex. You spread over time and space, even more complex. It's dynamic. It changes over time. The ecosystem is not like a steady state. It itself is dynamic and moving. It's ambiguous, ecosystem ambiguous itself. It's uncertain and it's precautionary. Because if it waits sometimes too long to make decisions until it has perfect information, it can be too late. Because there are cliffs in our ecosystem. You wait too long, a species is gone. You wait too long and the glaciers melt. If you wait too long, then the ocean currents change direction. So you actually need to act before you have perfect information. It's also really disruptive. It's disruptive of lives and livelihoods. It's changing the rules of the game. It's challenging settled expectations again and again and again. It's doing that to very powerful industry, but it's also doing it to individual people and the communities as well. And the, trying to make the laws that are redistributed in this way, that causes friction. It's friction in our lawmaking system. It'd be hard for any lawmaking system. There's no lawmaking system in the world which is very good about that kind of redistributive spread. It's very hard sell to people. But it's a particularly hard sell here in the United States. Not for like bad reasons necessarily, but just because we have certain values reflected in our lawmaking systems, which are systematically hard for environmental law to deal with. We, se we separate deliberately at the federal level power between the three branches. And the framers did that because they were very distrustful of big government. They were very concerned about redistributive laws, taking wealth from some for others. So they put in checks and balances. They basically did it to try to make it hard to pass exactly the kind of laws that environmental law often needs. And they gave limited power, right? Under Article I, the most important branch, they have limited power to Congress. Congress does not have general police power authority. Congress has spending clause authority. It has taxing authority. It has commerce authority. But that's not general police power authority like the states have to pass laws to promote public health, safety, and welfare. So environmental law is forced to deal with the model 
of Commerce Clause or, right, Spending Clause, Inflation Reduction Act. It's forced to sort of try to cabin these things into categories which weren't really necessarily, right, drafted with this kind of law in mind at all or these kinds of big role for the federal government. And we have, right, power in the states. Deliberately, we are a federalism system believe strongly in state sovereignty. And states do very important things, including on environmental law. But environmental law is often pushing for national approaches, now international. But national, which doesn't fit with sort of the way the framers were thinking of the role of the national government versus the states. If you leave the states to their own devices, right, they are, and this is what they do. If you ever take environmental law, a great course, if you ever take it, you'll see that disproportionately states naturally place their polluting facilities at the border. Case after case involved polluting facilities at the border. Why? Because the state can have all the economic benefit of the activity and they can send their pollution downwind and downstream to another state. That's the economic rational thing to do. But that's why you need a federal system. And you can't just rely on the states alone. We also have a lawmaking system where we elect people to office on two year, four year, and six year cycles. Right? Deliberately. Not for like 20 year cycles, but so they're more responsive to people and what's going on. And that makes them more responsible to the here and now. The here and now want to know what are you doing for us right here and right now? What's this doing to my gasoline prices right now? What's this doing to my heating rates right now? In our political system, the there and then don't have a vote. The here and now have a vote. And elected officials disproportionately respond right, to the needs of the here and now, especially right, those who can do campaign financing. And those tend to be those powerful industries whose belief that their things are going to be disrupted. Or a community, a community like right, a coal mining community, which is concerned that it, its things, its economic expectations, its jobs, its livelihood are going to be disrupted. And this has led, since 1990, to this enormous partisan divide in Congress. If you look to the first two dec couple decades, the 70s, 80s, unbelievable bipartisanship in environmental law. The environmental laws of the 70s, amazing laws, ambitious, demanding laws. They passed by, I think, an average vote of 330, 30, 330 to 30 in the House, and about 76 to 5 in the Senate. That ended in 1990. And since 1990, we've had complete gridlock in Congress. Congress has not passed a significant substantive environmental law really since 1990. That's when they did the Clean Air Act. The Water Act was 87. Hazardous Waste was 84. Endangered Species Act was 1973. And that obviously has implications we'll talk about for things like the major question doctrine. But Congress basically shut down. The cross-cutting issue is triggered by environmental law. And that, these are ones that why the court matters. There are a lot of issues which tend to affect environmental law, which are not necessarily environmental law like per se, but they affect environmental lawmaking. And environmental law puts pressure on them systematically again and again. That's true for administrative law. In the 1970s, my then environmental law professor, Dick Stewart, wrote an article called The Reformation of American Administrative Law in the Harvard Law Review. And it showed how the sort of emergence of the environmental statutes was changing administrative law. It was putting pressure on agencies to make decisions of a scope, right, they hadn't done before. Through informal comment rulemaking, they were doing laws of massive disruptive scope. And how that was reforming administrative law, both statutorily and the courts. And how the courts struggled with how demanding they should, how deferential they should be, and how demanding a hard look at the agency decisions underlying those rules. Constitutional law, 
Article 3 standing. Article 3 standing, as we'll see, requires a concrete imminent injury. Well, when you're spreading out cause and effect over time and space, it's hard to show a concrete imminent injury. There's nothing concrete or imminent about it. It's spread out over time and space. It's not concrete. It's not necessarily imminent either. So how do you, do, how do you work with those constitutional tests? Federalism. How do you deal with the fact that we want to protect states and state sovereignty? When the federal government, to get these laws done, needs the help and assistance of the states. It needs to sort of find ways to corral the states to help get these laws implemented and administered. The federal government can't possibly do it itself. And the Commerce Clause. The federal environmental laws are not necessarily about commerce. They're about environmental protection. Yes, they regulate a lot of interstate commerce. But the statutes aren't written in terms of regulation of interstate commerce. They're written in terms of environmental protection or endangered species protection, which is not necessarily easily said that's a regulation of interstate commerce. And finally, property law. Environmental law responds to the fact that it sees in these activities your use of land, your use of natural resources, that you are harming activities. You are harming people downwind, downstream, or future generations by the destruction of the land, the destruction of aquifers. So environmental law tends to look at land and natural resource use and exploitation and regulate it and restrict what people thought they could do. No, that's not land, that's a wetland. If you fill that in, it will have these downstream effects. So thanks the Constitution protects property rights from takings without just compensation, the Constitution here too challenge and lays, challenge a lot of modern environmental law. Now these are, believe it or not, my notes for the very first class I taught in environmental law in August 1983. That is, believe it or not, handwriting. <laughs> and it's gotten much worse since then, because I don't do any handwriting anymore. But these are actually notes I took in uh, to my first class. Um, you can see I said, in many respects, no such thing as environmental law. I was four years out of law school. And I was trying to think about how I want to start that first class. And I said, no such thing as environmental law. It really is a context often for other areas of law, cross-cutting law, constitutional law, administrative law, tort, tax, securities, uh, love canal, uh, corporation, how, all, how environmental law has statutes like the Clean Act and the Clean Water Act. But actually, a lot of environmental law is decided in these other four. And that means environmental law may itself Right? Raise questions of federalism, raise questions of constitutional law, raise questions of standing, raise questions of the Commerce Clause. But it also means you have to watch those other cases too that are not environmental that involve those same issues because they're going to have implications for environmental law. It's why I always tell my students the best environmental lawyers are not the best environmentalists. They're the best lawyers. You have to be a great lawyer. All right, resulting friction is reflected in the court's 1970s and 1980s docket. Article 3 standing. Early on, the question is how much can we attenuate causation? And the court early on allowed very attenuated causation allegations and standing, recognizing you needed it for environmental protection. And they allowed suits to be brought. Chevron. An early case, right? A case from 1984 about to what extent should we defer to administrative agencies and their interpretation of, of these ambiguous language to try to make things work. Case like Keystone Bituminous in 1987, where the court sharply limited the old Penn Coal regulatory takings case from the 1920s and said, no, this kind of surface mining control which is going to sharply reduce the coal mining you can do underground, it's not a taking of property. Even though it may devastate your economic expectations up to 85, 90%, but it's not going to be a taking. And the Commerce Clause Authority. In 1981, the court 
P.D. Ridden by Thurgood Marshall, rejected the notion that these new kinds of environmental laws raise commerce clause concerns unanimously about the extent of Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause to pass this kind of law. Now, how for 50 years the court of our law sort of overcame what I would say is an increasingly conservative court. Let me explain what I mean by that. In 1969, which is right before modern environmental law happens, so the National Environmental Policy Act assigned a law January 1st, 1970, EPA, December 1970, Clean Air Act, our first major pollution control law, December 31st, 1970, followed by law after law after law after law in the 1970s. So in 1969, it's the Warren Court. It's progressive court. In 1972, it's the Burger Court. Just three years later, with four new justices. President Richard Nixon, in his first term, appointed four justices of the court, including the Chief Justice. That's more than Donald Trump did, right, in his term in office. It's four, including the Chief Justice. Each one was viewed as being a law and order conservative justice. And the court has been conservative ever since. And then, every 20 years or so, a more conservative justice has been added to the court. Powell joined in 1972, Scalia joined in 86, Alito 2006. And the relation to environmental law is not incidental. Justice Powell. Justice Powell go, joins the court in January 72. This is the memo he wrote in August 23, 1971. It's called the Powell Memo. It's a memo he wrote to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce about what was happening in the courts, what was happening in Congress. And he decried what was happening. He criticized the attack on American business and the American economy, with environmental statutes being a prime example of it. These young men despise the American political system and economic system. Stampedes of politics support almost any legislation related to consumerism or the environment. Opportunity in the courts. The ACLU has done effective use of the courts. The Chamber of Commerce needs to do that for business interests. Powell makes that in August. He's nominated about six weeks later to the U.S. Supreme Court. He's on the court in January 72. Powell was managing partner of a law firm called Hunt and Williams of Virginia. His clients were the utility industry in the air and water pollution cases. Once on the court, you see him concurring, but talking about, complaining about the Clean Air Act and its devastating consequences to the public. If Congress had known that this is what they had passed, they couldn't possibly have passed this law. That's the Clean Air Act. The Endangered Species Act, one of the most famous cases, TVA versus Hill, where the court upheld the application of the Endangered Species Act, even though it would cause right, the closure or the non-completion of a dam. Powell dissents from it. A long shadow. I can't believe Congress would ever have intended this absurd result. Everyone thinks of Powell as a moderate. He was a moderate in many ways. But on environmental issues, he had a distinct perspective. And on standing, he believed the courts had gone too far in allowing a lot of these lawsuits. So he promoted the three-factor test, which is now the modern standard te standing test. Concrete injury, fairly traceable causation, redressable judicial action, all things which are systematically hard once you spread out cause and effect over time and space. Justice Scalia joins in 1986. In 1983, wrote this law review article decrying how the courts had allowed environmentalists access to enforce the laws. Ensuring strict enforcement of environmental laws met with approval in the classrooms of Cambridge and that other place, but not in the factories of Detroit and the mines of West Virginia. So Scalia joins the court and he has a bullseye 
on the environmental statutes and overreaching as well. Once to the court, he quickly authors two opinions involving Article III standing. This is the second one, Lujan versus Defendants of Wildlife, where he takes the test which Powell crafted and he applies to reject environmental standing of citizens seeking to enforce the Endangered Species Act. On the regulatory taking issue, he authors the court's opinion of Lucas v. South Carolina Coastal Council, which creates a per se takings test if an environmental regulation or land use regulation deprives them of all economically viable use of their property. There are two Scalia's on agency authority. Scalia 1 and Scalia 2, that's why I call it two Scalia's. <laughs> if you look at Scalia from 1986 to 2001, he is actually fairly deferential to agencies. He also likes to follow the plain meaning wherever it goes and he relishes it when it goes against how people would think he personally prefers. Because it shows how much he's committed to his principle of textualism and clear language. Scalia from 2001-2016 is a different justice. He no longer, he now questions, he questions agencies. He worries about government overreaching. He worries particularly about EPA overreaching. I remember talking to someone because I won a case with Scalia's vote in the 1990s. I went to one of Scalia's clerks. I said, I'm going to try to make the same argument now. She said, no, no, no. It won't work anymore. Former Scalia clerk. He just doesn't approach things. I don't know why. I can speculate, but not for this talk. You see the EPA Mercury decision in 2015 where he rejects EPA's view, refused to defer to the agency uh, interpretation. You see it in the Clean Power Plan in 2016 when he joins the majority of five and stays the Clean Power Plan. The first time the Supreme Court had ever reached down to stay a rule promulgated by an agency of massive dimensions when the lower court had refused to stay it. And they stayed it over just a few days. About three to four days when the court wasn't sitting, without arguing, without full briefing, they got together and stayed the plan. This was actually Scalia's last significant vote on the court because he died uh, that next weekend. You see it involving Congressional Commerce Clause authority, questioning the reach of Congress authority under the Commerce Clause to regulate water pollution nationwide. Sam Alito joins the court in 2006. Unlike when Powell joined the court when there was no environmental opposition, unlike when Scalia joined the court when there was no environmental opposition, the word environment, notwithstanding its writings, never appears once in any of the confirmation hearings or the reports. That was not true for Alito. For Alito, the environmental groups opposed his confirmation. And I would add, I think on fairly thin basis, but their concern was heightened by what they had seen happen before. They saw that he had voted against environmental standing in a case of the Third Circuit judge. They saw that he had not, ref not deferred to EPA's interpretation of what kind of remedy was needed in a hazardous waste case and a W.R. Grace case. Again, joining majority. And they saw they dissented in a case involving Commerce Clause Authority. Not an environmental case, but it showed that he was taking, they thought, a more aggressive view of how much the court had cut back on Commerce Clause standing. Sorry, Commerce Clause Authority of Congress in the Lopez case in the mid-90s. I've done a survey looking at the environmental protection scores of all the justices from 94 to 22. And what I do is I look to see whether their vote was the one favored by environmentalists or not in all the environmental cases. And that's obviously tricky, right? Because a case could be favored, a position could be favored by environmentalists, but actually be a really weak argument, right? So it's not as though just because environmentalists support it, that means it should have won. That's a separate question. But what's fascinating, if you look at this, you do see some patterns. Here's one you see. No one's as low as Alito. That does suggest there's something 
about the environmental cases. You get that from the rhetoric and his opinions. There's some heightened <coughs> skepticism, if not hostility, to the danger of overreaching environmental. That's a really low score. And that's October 94 to 2022. Take a look 2017 to 2022. No one, right, is close to that. Only an example I found like this is Justice Douglas. <laughs> Justice Douglas, and I criticized him in a law review article in 2000 for this. Justice Douglas always voted for the environmental side, regardless of the merits, right? No matter how weak the argument was, he always voted for them. That's not what I call the measure of a justice, a good justice, either way. So why the court, notwithstanding the starting conservative and his addition, of increasingly conservative justices over time. There's no question Alito is more conservative than Scalia. There's no question that Scalia is more conservative than Powell. Why has the court been relatively moderate on environmental issues? And I think they were. Fairly balanced, win some, lose some, until October term 2020. Of course, three reasons. One, what I call the stealth justices. Two, the mitigating justices. And three, Justice Scalia's joyful combativeness. So what I might one, these are the stealth justices. And they cover the court for 36 years. All Republican appointees considered to be sort of conservative when appointed. Each one turned out to be actually very sensitive to environmental concerns. And very aware of the need maybe to massage some of those cross-cutting issues whether it's property clause protection, standing law, administrative law, deference to agencies, Blackman, Stevens, and Souter. Blackman got on the court. He immediately dissented from a big standing case called Sierra Club v. Morton. He joined Justice Douglas in dissent in that case. Stevens became the champion of these issues in his latter years, and Souter throughout. Then I call the mitigating justices. They were there for 38 years of this time period. These are justices who are deeply and firmly conservative and concerned about government overreaching. But they're also very, like, fact dependent. They worry about fairness. Justice O'Connor in particular worried a lot about fairness and whether something made sense or not. So there are times she would vote for the property owner in a takings case. She thought it was just unfair. And there were times she didn't because she didn't think it was unfair. A very pragmatic justice. And Justice Kennedy, very different than O'Connor, but someone from California understood the time and space issues. He understood how land could be fragile. He understood how the common law and private property rights were, couldn't be static in light of this new information. He also was, with all due celebration of an alum, a fairly pompous individual <laughs> who loved to write big, whether he was writing big to eliminate the death penalty for certain people or to, for gay marriage or on the industry side environmental cases or in some other cases, the swing vote. So you have cases, they, oh sorry, then you have Scalia. Scalia had a joyful combativeness. He was to some extent like Douglas. Uh, Scalia was not very good at getting people to his position because he loved to criticize and mock people who disagree with him. So he didn't actually create majorities the way he might have. He, he didn't get very many significant cases to write when he was on the court. Because often Chief Justice were wary of giving him cases were closely divided because he might lose them. Heller, the second, that's one of his really big cases he got. But they're not that many. Someone was on the court for so long at a conservative court. So he pushed away Kennedy. He pushed away O'Connor by criticizing him again and again and again whenever they compromised. So you have cases that push back 
in favor of Article 3 state environmentalists. Friends here at Fee Lay Law in 2000, Mass for CPA, where you have Kennedy and O'Connor in the red law, and Kennedy and Mass for CPA supplying the fifth vote for a major ruling on standing. A regulatory taking. You've got Kennedy and O'Connor joining the majority to say no taking here. In Murray, Wisconsin, you have Kennedy creating the majority to say there's no taking here. On agency authority, a series of cases, big cases, big wins for the government. One involving the Clean Air Act, the other Endangered Species, the other Clean Water Act. Government won case after case with Kennedy and O'Connor, one of them or both, creating the difference in the cases. And Congressional Commerce Clause Authority. Kennedy denied Justice Scalia his majority for his limited view of the Congress authority under the Commerce Clause for the Clean Water Act. He denied it to him the same way he denied him uh, or he sent signals uh, and denied in the Lujan case majority on a little part of it, as did Souter. How the court's hyper-concerning threatens the role of environmental law's promise. I'll talk just a few minutes about this and then love to take questions. We have three nominees to the court done during the Trump administration. Very conservative individuals. Uh, and with their votes, we've now had in a very short period of time a series of rulings that are very portentous for the future of environmental law. We've got questions on standing, sort of heightened standing requirements, about concreteness. We've got disparaging of the standing decision of Massachusetts versus EPA, where the court is limiting it. And I think it was uh, Justice Gorsuch who suggested people wanted to rely on it, should put it on their bookshelf and leave it there. On regulatory takings, the court has already overruled a significant long-standing takings case, which has limited the practical viability of bringing takings cases. The court overruled that in 2019. Uh, they re-argued it because when they first argued it, Justice Kavanaugh wasn't yet on the court. So we argued it, he supplied the fifth vote. And an agency authority, the one that everyone sort of knows more about. The major questions doctrine. I mean, the major questions doctrine is peculiarly challenging for environmental law. Because a court is saying, if you've got a rule of some scope of significance, left to be defined exactly what we mean by that, that you have to have clear congressional authorization to allow the agency to do it. Now, in theory, right, in theory, that actually has a lot of force to it. If you're talking about some rule which is of major import, it would make sense, in theory, to say, well, let's, have, let's make sure the branch which is most democratically accountable, Article I, let's make sure you know, that they've actually thought about it and they authorized it. I think that's hard to resist at an intuitive level. There's natural force to that. The problem with it is this. As applied to environmental law right now, it is potentially disastrous. Why? Congress doesn't create any no statute. They haven't done the Clean Air Act since 1990, the Water Act since 87. So as a practical matter, you're may not ever find that clear congressional authorization. And we have problems that are massive, like climate change, and problems that have a clock ticking at the same time. The longer you wait, the exponentially harder it is to do anything about it, and the potential for a catastrophic effect happening and the irreversible effects looms ever larger, you know, sort of every year at this point. And you have statutes which were written a long time ago when this wasn't the rule. Statutes which actually gave the agency broad, capacious authority. And everyone's relied on that for decades, and the rules are now being changed at a time when you actually can't expect Congress to go in and fix it. So there is theoretical appeal, I can't deny it, but the practical implications of it are enormous. And those are the kind of things that might have affected Otto O'Connor and a Kennedy. 
and certainly the stealth justices. You got Western UCPA, and in that case, right, they make it quite clear. When Congress isn't doing things, it's natural, but you can't do that. Again, I can't fight the idea there's some value to that. I just worry about its significance. And I don't think it's compelled. I can't say it's indefensible, but I don't think it's compelled. Then you have the Sackett case, where the court uses background principles to require, right, again, sort of clear congressional authorization. Background principles, one, of federalism, and two, property law. Sound familiar? That's what environmental law does. It challenges federalism by its nature, and it challenges property rights by its nature. So once again, we have canons being used here, which courts create, canons which have a disproportionate effect on the ability of the federal government to address these issues. And then overruling Chevron. Ironically, right, a case which, which the government and Chevron won over the Natural Resource Defense Council. So it was actually a case which environmentalists lost that allowed agencies to have more deference. But it's one which has become the bedrock of administrative law for decades now, upon which agencies rely, particularly now that you can't get Congress to amend anything. When I first practiced, started practicing law sort of really in the 80s, you would see this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The courts would rule one way, Congress would respond. They would codify it sometimes, they would reject it other times. They'd modify it other times. But there was real dialogue. There was a dialogue between Congress, the courts, and administrative agencies during the eight, 1980s in particular. That is gone at this point. Uh, and so we have to wait and see what happens in these cases, whether they actually overrule Chevron or for what people like, whether they Kaiser them, uh, which just really means that they create sort of a series of exceptions to Chevron where it doesn't apply. In the Supreme Court, as a practical matter, Chevron's gone anyway. No one cites Chevron anymore in the United States Supreme Court. They haven't done it for years. But it's still alive in the lower courts. Um, Commerce Clause Authority, in the Sackett case, separate opinion written by Thomas and Gorsuch. Unnecessary to the result, separate concurrent opinion, but they put a bullseye on the Commerce Clause. And they said, by the way, let's talk about environmental law and commerce clause authority. Nowhere is a deviation from what this court should be doing in commerce clause more evident than environmental law, which is usually dependent upon expansive interpretation of the commerce clause, referring back to that unanimous 1981 decision in Hodel. So it's teeing up, right, for second guessing the constitutional basis of modern federal pollution control law. And a second paragraph, many environmental regulators seem to pushing the limits of the court's Neil Dare era Commerce Clause president, then referring to the Endangered Species Act uh, as an example, and also Clean Water Act and a Swank case. Can EPA environmentalists work with the court? I do a lot of work in this area. I almost only represent respondents. I never get to represent petitioners because environmentalists don't petition for Supreme Court review. Um, what they do is they have to basically respond to it. It's a world right now of soft, medium versus hard landings. When a case is granted, you're trying to figure out damage control. Can you get the court to do something narrow rather than broad? It's rare you get a win. Every once in a while there is a win. And that's because the court takes these cases on a hair trigger. They're ready to think there's a big problem when there often isn't. And to their credit, once they get full briefing and argument, they often realize that she was an easy case. It wasn't wrong about it. But beside than those, we're basically trying to push for soft landings and avoid the hard landing. Aggressive cert, the court takes cases, West Virginia and Sackett, these did not meet the normal indicia of cert, neither one. EPA had already said it basically was not was going to do the clean power plant anymore. EPA had basically already allowed the Sackett to build on their property. The cases were not technically moot, and I think we're going to see EPA learn from that. And they're going to start mooting these cases and not just saying they're dead and buried, uh, but burying them and jumping all over on top. 
But we've seen cert denied. The court denied cert on April 23rd, uh, April 24th, 2023, in some of the climate change litigation tort cases being brought in state court. That was sort of a surprise. Uh, Kavanaugh uh, dissented, would have granted the petition. Alito has Conical Phillips stock, so he doesn't participate. Uh, and the question is whether there's two votes there. I, I kind of make Kavanaugh and Gorsuch a split personality on, on this one, <laughs> because they each have ways you might tug at them a little bit. Um, and Roberts and, and, and Barrett, these are not, none of these is a moderate, right? There's potential for moderation. These are legitimately conservative, sincerely conservative judges, justices on the court. But there are ways that they're showing like, it's some give, some willingness to break away from the more conservative members of the court. The court heard on February 21st oral argument in a case involving EPA's good neighbor rule. This is under the Clean Air Act, which involves interstate air pollution. And the question was whether to stay that rule while the litigation happens for several years, like they did in the Clean Power Plan. It's a very interventionist thing to do, but something the court is being asked more frequently to do. First time they did it was the Clean Power Plan. This time, to the court's credit, the court actually said, we're not going to decide this issue. The case is before the D.C. Circuit. The case is not in front of the Supreme Court. The only thing before the Supreme Court is whether the rule should be stayed while the D.C. Circuit decides it. And the court, to its credit, didn't do what it did in the Clean Power Plan case, which is with like no, hardly any briefing at all, just sort of decided, seat of pants, when they weren't even in the same country, many of them were traveling overseas at the time. Uh, here they held briefing on it and oral argument. So I was listening to that to see, is there any kind of sign that there might be a break here of Barrett or Roberts to deny? Roberts has at least one time refused to, to stay a rule. Uh, and Barrett did at least say one thing at oral argument. You didn't point detail to that, that I recall. Like what, I mean, you, you've talked about projected injury, projected costs that you're going to incur, but presumably, I mean, the rule's been in effect for a while. Why haven't you talked about that? I think you're kind of shifting gears now. I mean, have you incurred significant financial costs that are unreasonable? Have there been, Justice Jackson asked um, Ohio's counsel about whether there have been these kinds of disruptions to this point? Right, so she's asking, why do you need to stay? This rule doesn't go into effect for several years. Why do you need to have it stayed now? So at least some sign but nothing from Roberts. And we're still waiting for the decision. These are our two oldest justices on the court, uh, age 74 uh, and be, I think 78 soon. And you know, if changes happen, if someone leaves the court, um, that could change the dynamic considerably. And I'm happy to take questions. Oh, no, I think, oh, I think there's real potential. I, actually, I, I think, I mean, not for cabinet, for embracing it. I, 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 think there, I think that is, and believe me, they did that for a reason. They've teed it up. Um, I don't know what, uh, I, would, I, would, I don't know what Kavanaugh thinks. It wouldn't surprise me if he's um, sympathetic to it. Roberts may be sympathetic at some level, and I don't know whether uh, Barrett is. That could be six potentially sympathetic uh, to it. Uh, I think Danger Species Act would be the most vulnerable, uh, but there are others as well. And I think that, that's there for a reason. It's inviting litigation. And there are a lot of people up there who'd like to bring that forward. So I expect that'll be the next wave, this Commerce Clause. We've been expecting it since 1995, when they decided Lopez. So at least it's been delayed for 30 years. Yeah, Ben. Um, we saw with Chevron how its political balance kind of changed over time. And I'm wondering if that's possible for Lopez to Yeah, no, no, no. In, in theory, it can cut either way. That's, that's right. 
to the extent that things tend to be more disruptive of settled expectations, depends on how they define major. It may be major is defined in a way which tend to be more triggered by impact on economic expectations that are significant uh, than, uh, than not. Uh, uh, and so in theory it could. On the other hand, I've always worried a little bit about when major questions doctrine sort of evolved and came out. It happened really during the Obama administration. You can trace it back earlier. Uh, but it's during the Obama administration in terms of Chevron that all of a sudden when the, we have an administration doing fairly aggressive things with statutory language uh, because there was no new statute and they were trying to address these problems, all of a sudden for the first time Chevron became something which a lot of different judges like Gorsuch started attacking. Uh, so I think their sensitivity to government overreaching with Chevron and the rest happened during the Obama administration. I don't think that was coincidence. Now in theory, right, it could work, it could work both ways. If it does, I still don't think it's the right way to have government work, uh, but uh, it could be more equal. I'm just a little suspicious of its origins. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, the question is whether or not I see uh, potential for the U.S. courts, U.S. Supreme Court, to adopt the sort of more human rights perspective, positive law perspective for environmental law here. And my short answer is no, uh, I don't. I think it's just a very different tradition, very different culture. We don't really have positive rights uh, that way in our constitution. We don't have the tradition. I've always thought if the Juliana case, which is the case of our Children's Trust, which is a wonderful case, inspired case, great lawyers, claiming a constitutional right to a stable climate system. If that ever went to the Supreme Court, I've always thought it would lose nine to zero. Uh, I thought it would lose nine to zero a decade ago with a, a more moderate court. I don't think we'd ever get to the merits though, because they'll lose on standing uh, before they even get to the merits. So I, I, don't think, I don't think they have it. I don't think, certainly though, Breyer would have never voted that way. Ginsburg would not have voted that way. I don't think Kagan would vote that way. I know less about Sotomayor and Jackson. But I, I doubt it, but I don't know. Uh, Breyer certainly never would have adopted that approach, uh, and Ginsburg wouldn't have. There, you can look at their opinions in other cases. Uh, you can see they wouldn't go that. It's just not here. Uh, but standing is going to kill it anyway, in those cases. I don't think we have. Now, state constitutional law, there are some states which have written their constitutions. They actually have positive rights in them expressly. If we had that in the federal constitution, they might have some legs. So there's some state that do. Montana had a big case recently. So I, you can imagine happening there uh, as well, uh, but not like it's happened in, in other countries of the world. And as we've discussed, even though it's other countries of the world who have done it, you still have to look to the remedy to see whether or not they're willing to have a remedy which is really going to override democratic judgments or ultimately they delegate to democratic uh, lawmaking authorities in those countries and no one's taken it that far. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, sh I'll show you. I'll give you one quick e example for agencies of the EPA. People in my environmental law class would know this one. So big loss of the Clean Power Plan. Uh, the Clean Power Plan in the West Virginia case basically based emission limitations on coal-fired power plants on their ability to shift their generation from coal-fired plants to natural gas plants and to solar and wind on the grid, taking advantage of the grid. And they said, we think you reduce your pollution because you can shift it to these other sources on the grid uh, which don't produce so many greenhouse gas emissions. Court said you can't do that. Uh, that's a, that generation shifting is a major question. EPA is trying to regulate the grid. You can't do it. So here's what they've done. Um, one, they passed the, clean, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. What did the Inflation Reduction Act do? It gave 
hundreds of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars for many things of all kinds, which people applaud and by environmentalists, and then it gave hundreds of millions of dollars to basically the energy industry for carbon capture sequestration, which allows you to, to sort of reduce your emissions by capturing it. Uh, environment, all environmentalists hate it, environmental justice people don't like it at all because they think it's the wrong step in the wrong direction. Uh, but that's part of why they got opposition reduced by the uh, energy industry, by saying that. All right, so EPA is, pr is promulga gonna promulgate a rule very soon which is going to say, you coal-fired plants, you can reduce your emissions down to here. The reason why we think you can is we think it's now economically achievable to do so. Why is it economically achievable? Because we've now given you, made available, hundreds of millions of dollars to make carbon capture sequestration now achievable. But here's the great thing. The Clean Air Act is what we call a technology-based emission limitation. It's not a design standard. So the energy industry doesn't have to actually use it. They actually now have to meet the standard the cheapest way they can. And guess what the cheapest way they can is? Generation shifting. So EPA is no longer gonna base the emission limitation on generation shifting. They're using the subsidy to require it based on carbon capture, but no industry is gonna choose the more expensive way to do it. So even though it's economically achievable. So they're going to get, the idea is they're going to get their generation shifting uh, indirectly. So that's another, and what EPA is generally doing is avoiding any kind of novel interpretation of statutes. They're trying to say, you know, they now in their latest auto rule had 30 pages in the preamble on why this isn't a major question uh, and why this is just based upon what's technologically achievable and economically available. So they're trying to ground it elsewhere. Lizzie. Do you see a double standard in the standing test where anti-environmental, anti-agency advocates get the sort of uh, Sackett approach and sort of pro-agency, pro-environmental get the more oh. trans-union Lujan? Or do you think there's a way for those pro-environmental groups to almost exploit the Sackett avenue that they've created? Well, in, in terms of standing? or standing. Yeah, on, on the sta Sack actually standing, Sack didn't really have the same. But anyway, on, on the standing issue, it's always been asymmetric because the statutes regulate the here and now. So they tend to have a concrete imminent injury. Uh, and for the benefit of there and then, they're the ones who are on the other side of the equation. Uh, so they have to show that their injury over here is concrete and imminent. And it's, you know, stretches a little bit. It stretches it spatially, it stretches it temporally. So there's an asymmetric nature built into the standing standing test. If you look to the case of the 1970s, the courts basically were willing to allow those things to go. In the mass for CPA, they allowed it to go. And talk about a, a spread out of time and space, climate, it's about as much spread out as you could have, and the court let it go. But if you look to the, the mass for CPA case decided, what, in 2007, uh, um, uh, there are no justices left from the majority. Uh, there are, I think, three justices left from the dissent, uh, and there are a bunch of new justices who've been added. So there's not much question if they ever get a case like that. Uh, they won't overrule Master CPA. I think they'll just sort of you know, whittle away to the facts of that case. I think that's probably it. It's 120. You all have uh, classes and stuff, and that's what I was told then. But let me tell you, it's uh, really delightful to see people. I've got a lot of people in this room, uh, some I've been working with, uh, for three years, uh, some sort of new, first year and I've had in class yet, some in first year I've had in class yet, and it's a real treat to see everybody together. Last week of classes, uh, graduates, I will see you at uh, commencement. Be sure to introduce me to your parents, I mean that. As I've told some of you, I give really good parent. <laughs> I will walk up and I will say, do you realize what a wonderful and I just non-stop, I'm non-stop. Uh, and if you have a younger sibling there, they want to kill me. Um, uh, those who are second year, I'm not teaching the fall, but I'll be here in September, um, and I'll be back in residence at least uh, in the spring, off to England, uh, otherwise in the fall. And those who are one else, um, have a great summer, and congratulations on almost being done. Thanks a lot.